So we all know why we're here, um, to mourn the death, but at the same time celebrate the life of our dear friend, Brother Sparacco. Uh, first and foremost, we want to welcome everyone, and thank you for being here. We know that Joe would have really appreciated to see all of you here today. Um, he loved all of you, he felt you were family, and so uh, certainly he would be, uh, he'll be happy to hear about this. Um, so Brother Weisberg is going to do our discourse today. And so we'll invite him up, and then we're going to get to enjoy a little slide program as well. So, Brother Weisberg, please. So we're here to remember Joe Sparacco today. Joe was born in June 11, 1944, in the U.S., and passed away last January 28, 2015 at 70 years of age because of the brain tumor. Joe was a wonderful person. He was a faithful friend and a very, very loving friend. Most of us only know Joe since he moved to Mexico, and that was uh, back in 2006. But he didn't really get in contact with the brothers until 2008, when he was found in a door-to-door -door ministry uh, in Nick Teja. He got baptized in 2009, and remain faithful to Jehovah until his heart stopped beating. The day he was first contacted by the brothers, he was living in a garage, couldn't afford the rent, and he was literally starving. He had only eaten an onion and a few crackers that week. But his hunger was not only physical, it was also spiritual. He was praying for a Bible. The night before he was found, he prayed to God and said, if you really exist and you want to help me, now would be a good time. Needless to say, Joe started studying the Bible that same week he was found. Joe always struggled financially while he was here in Mexico, and his circumstances changed pretty often. At one point, he was homeless, living at the beach between two palm trees living in a hammock. Then he was living at someone's house by the beach, but with no electricity, no running water. Later on, he was able to afford rent. And right before he got the tumor, he was actually managing a building of apartments. Despite the changes, Joe always wore a big smile in his face. And that's because even though his secular circumstances were changing, his love for what he was learning from the Bible never wavered. He loved the congregation. He loved the friends. He loved having a relationship with God. And he loved being able to understand the deep things of the Bible. Joe was very young at heart. He enjoyed watching movies, going to play sports, going to play video games, and spending time with friends. As we all know, he was a talented artist. Very, very talented artist. So much that it was his art what actually brought him to Mexico. You see, the owner of Ishkaret was in, this, in the United States. He walked into Joe's gallery. He fell in love with his paintings. And that day he was hired, he was hired to paint murals here in Mexico. Something I personally appreciate about Joe was that how, how enriching his conversations were. He was very humble, never bragged about anything. But by the way he talked, you could tell that he knew what he was talking about. And that's because Joe wasn't just an artist. He was also a boxer when he was younger. He was a hairstylist, a businessman, and a, even a small plane pilot. And he excelled at all those activities. And that's probably why just talking to him was so educational. But Joe never felt complete. He said that, uh, uh, all those years after enjoying everything that this world had to offer, he felt hollow inside. He couldn't stand the system that we're living in. He never tolerated injustices. And it really, it really bothered him to see people suffer. He hated corruption and the way governments were dealing with people in general. And he would get just mad talking about it. That's what kind of man Joe was. Now we understand how rapidly he made progress and how heart heartfelt his love for Jehovah was. 
He spent a lot of time just reading the Bible, learning of the wonderful qualities of his creator. If you ever walked into those places, you could see scriptures written in pieces of paper taped to the wall all over his apartment. It reminded him of his creator. And when he was living at the house by the beach, with no electricity, no running water, he made sure that during daylight, he could have time to read the Bible. One day, a brother gave Joe a flashlight and a mosquito net to put over his bed so he could, so he could sleep comfortably. And Joe was immensely grateful for that. And he said, now I can read the Bible during the night. I'm living like a king. He appreciated what the Bible teaches about God's purpose for the earth, stated in Genesis 1:28, And he couldn't wait for the time uh, where this purpose will take place all over the earth, that we will all be able to enjoy to the full, having all the animals and different creatures of the sea and the heaven and the sky in sub subjection. And he painted about that hope. Uh, and just by looking at his, at his paintings, you could see that he was immersed in that hope, and he could actually live it through his painting, through his art. It was real to him. One of Joe's favorite scriptures is uh, the one in Ecclesiastes 9:10. Maybe we can read that together. Let's let's turn our Bibles to Ecclesiastes 9:10. It reads, whatever your hand finds to do, do with, your, with all your might. For there is no work, no planning, no knowledge, no wisdom in the grave where you are going. He always said that he wished he could have learned the truth earlier in his life. So he was determined to use the time he had now to do as much as he could for Jehovah and, and for his friends at the congregation. It didn't matter if he had money or if he didn't have money. He was always willing to share a good plate of pasta with his friends. Joe knew that this life wasn't all there is for mankind. And he had the resurrection hope engraved in his heart. He believed in the words found in Acts 24:15. Let's read that together as well. Acts 24. You can almost hear Joe's voice when you read this. And I have hope toward God, which hope these men also look forward to, that there is going to be a resurrection of both the righteous and the unrighteous. Days before Joe died, when you could still talk to him on the phone, he would talk as he will see you tomorrow. He was making plan plans. He was already making plans and places to visit, landscapes to paint, games to play. The resurrection hope was real to Job, and that's why he didn't accept any extreme treatments to prolong his life. He kept referring to the time when all this garbage from Satan is over, and the real life is here as what they really are, a very, very near future for mankind. Even though he used to believe that when he died, he would go to heaven. After studying the Bible and after examining the scripture, he was then convinced that his hope was to live here on earth. And he was able to explain this to many people and friends back home when he was sick. He liked to use Revelation 14.3 to explain that only a specific number of people would go to heaven. And then he would read to them Luke 23.43 to explain why his hope was to live in paradise on earth. Joe died faithful to the God he loved. He knew that, as Ecclesiastes 7 1 says, the day of the death is better than the day of one being born. And if you think about it, Joe, for 64 years, he lived in this world. And it frustrated him to see how this system is taking place. He was not completely happy. On the other hand, for the last six years of his life, 
Job was finally satisfied with the answers the Bible gave him. Job was complete having Jehovah God, the creator of all the beautiful things that he painted about as his personal friend. Job found a real family in this congregation, a family that stuck close to him when he needed it the most, a family that took shifts, days and nights when he was in the hospital just to make sure no one did him any wrong. And it brings tears to our eyes when we talk about those who have passed away, doesn't it? Especially if they were faithful to the end, as Joe was. So the question is why? Why do we do, why do, we do this to ourselves? We're here this afternoon, his body is not here, his family is not here, but the reality, brothers, is we became Joe's family. For many, he was like a father, for many of us. He was like an uncle, like a brother, like a grandparent for some of the kids in the congregation. So all of us here lost that. And the loss is mutual. And that's why Ecclesiastes 7.2 says that it's better to go to the house of mourning in occasions like this, to support each other, to be there for each other. True, having the hope of resurrection helps to put things into perspective because we know or we have the hope of seeing him again. But that does not change the pain that we feel today. It's like when someone we are really close to come and visit us here. We also have the hope of seeing them again, but when they leave, don't you feel sad? Because for a period of time you're not gonna see them? Well, Joe left us, he's away now. And it's only natural that we feel sad about it. Jesus Christ himself also felt upset when a friend of his died. And let's read about his feelings in the coming John 11. And we're going to read uh, 32 to 35. This is when Lazarus died. And John is actually the only gospel that actually reports this in details. So let's, uh, let's start reading 11, 32. Then we're gonna see how we, what we can learn from this. It says, when Mary arrived where Jesus was and caught sight of him, she fell at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her weeping, he groaned within himself and became troubled. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus gave way to tears. So notice there when he says Jesus, in 33 when he says Jesus groaned within himself, or as the footnote reads, Grown in the spirit. The original Greek suggests very deep emotion. And another translator, another translation here reads, Jesus was deeply moved. It also says he became troubled in that verse 33. Another translation renders, Jesus was visibly distressed. So obviously what he was feeling was evidently showing in his face, in his manner. And then in verse 35, it says, Jesus gave way to tears. And this is actually the shortest, uh, by the shortest verse in the Bible in the original Greek. It translated into Greek into one single word that literally means to weep silently. So evidently Jesus, while he was standing there by the tomb, he was shedding some tears. And why did Jesus cry? Well, as we saw there in verse 33, it was because he saw Mary weeping. And that really affected him. It touched him. So what can we learn from the tears of Jesus? Well, there's three important lessons that we can learn. The first one is it's okay to cry. Some of Jehovah's people have felt that perhaps it's wrong to weep over the loss of someone. That perhaps in some way it reveals that your faith in the hope of resurrection is not that strong. Well, don't let anyone tell you that. Grieve 
needs release. And crying can be a very helpful and necessary release. And those tears do not mean that your faith in the resurrection is weak. Jesus' hope of the resurrection wasn't weak at all. As a matter of fact, he resurrected Lazarus right after that. Still, he needed to grieve him at that time. The second lesson that we can learn from Jesus' tears is Jehovah must be a God of very tender feelings. How can we say so? Well, Jesus reflected Jehovah's qualities perfectly. So perfectly, so perfectly that in John 14, 9, Jesus said, He that has seen me has seen the Father also. And commenting on that verse, a watchtower made the following statement. Jesus imitated his Father so perfectly that had Jehovah God been on earth, he would have conducted himself exactly as Jesus did. Do you realize what that means? It means that if Jehovah God had been at the tomb of Lazarus at that time, Jehovah too would have cried. So the tears of Jesus prove that Jehovah is a God of tender feelings. And the third lesson that we can learn is Jehovah's people must be precious in his eyes. How? Well, Jesus cried because Mary cried. And he was deeply moved and touched by her tears. And we only weep and cry over something that is really important to us. So to illustrate this, imagine that in your way to the King Hall, you accidentally step into a very tiny insect and kill them. Would you have stopped and given way to tears? Probably not, right? On the other hand, when we lose someone dead, then we we'll weep over that person because such ones are important to us. Well, since Jesus perfectly displayed Jehovah's qualities and ways, and since Jesus was moved by Mary's tears to cry, what does this prove? Well, it proves that Jehovah sees and is deeply touched by your tears. And that proves that you who serve Jehovah must be precious in His eyes. That's a beautiful thought, isn't it? That we who love Jehovah are precious in his eyes. And being here today also makes us think on how we are using our life. Job died faithful to Jehovah. And up until, his, up until days before he passed away, he was preaching to every doctor and every uh, nurse that came in contact with him. Of his life, he played 17 marathons in trucks at that institution that he was in. He explained scriptures about, about blood to them and made them look them up. What a great example for us today. Joe is already waiting in Jehovah's memory for you and for me. But we are still here. We still need to grab with this system of things that he hated so much. And in the meantime, we have the unique privilege of telling people about Jehovah's purpose for mankind and continue to help people just like Joe to get close to Jehovah and to learn from his love. We are the generation that will see the end of this system of things. We are the ones who will experience Armageddon firsthand. And we are the ones who will be telling countless generations about this time. Can you see yourself doing that? Job's story and example should bring us together. Should give us even more confidence on how life-changing this message that we preach is. And please know that Jehovah can change your sorrow into joy by means of the resurrection. To benefit from this glorious prospect, we need to pay attention and obey to the exhortation at Psalms 105, 4 and 5. Maybe we can read that together. Psalms 105. This is what we need to do now. Serve for Jehovah and his strength. Seek his face constantly. Remember the wonderful works he has performed, his miracles, and the judgment, the judgment he has pronounced. When we found out that Job's tumor was back, we knew that death was immediate. Job knew that too. 
And I had a conversation with him that it was by far the hardest conversation I ever had. I asked him if he was okay, if he was worried, or if he was afraid. And this is what he said. And this is what he wanted me to share with you today. He said, don't worry, I'm not afraid of death. I am now in Jehovah's hands. I want all of you to stay in the truth so that you can welcome me back in the resurrection. I can tell you this though, I know for sure Jehovah will bring me back in the resurrection. I know that in my heart and I truly, truly love him. And I can't wait to see everyone in the congregation that are with me. So brothers, as long as we live, let's try to make a good name with Jehovah and remain faithful to the end. Thank you, Joanne, for those uh, fine words. Brothers, we're now, uh, a slideshow presentation has been prepared where we get to see Joe and remember him as we used to know him. And so we'll listen to that, and then we're going to conclude with the song.
great memories we have with him, don't we? So now we're going to conclude with a song together and then a prayer. We're going to sing song number 111. It's uh, entitled, He Will Call. It's from Job 14. And so let us all stand if we can and sing this together. Yeah.